Good afternoon, Dr. Mahana. Good afternoon. Dr. Ma'am. Good afternoon, Nishu. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Mahana. Good afternoon. So we can start. It's yeah, we can start. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, welcome to the second session of uh, Building Warehouse Competitiveness 2021 CII Institute of Logistics virtual session. Uh, and this second session of the day, uh, we are going to talk about towards a world-class and sustainable warehouse infrastructure. Uh, I'm privileged to uh, chair this session and uh, there is an esteemed panelist with lots and lots of experience in warehousing, supply chain, logistics, and for sure, uh, uh, sustainability. So one of our first panelists, uh, most welcome, uh, Mr. Rajiv Mehta. He's Chief Logistics Officer, Ambuja Cements Limited, uh, Lafarge Holcim uh, Group. Uh, he's having uh, three decades of experience with leading the national as well as international corporates uh, in senior leadership roles. He has extensive experience in uh, finance, commercial, business strategy, supply chain transformation, post-merger integration and people development. So welcome Mr. Mehta, we'll be uh, soon, uh, uh, we'll be hearing you, your views on the topic. Um, I have also on the panel, uh, a very active uh, person in the warehousing industry, uh, Mr. Jasmine Singh, Senior Executive Director, uh, C.V. Richard Ellis, uh, India. Uh, he's based out of Gurgaon. He has almost two and a half decades of uh, experience out of which 16 years have been dedicated to logistics industry. He has worked with the, all the biggies of the logistics, UPS, TNT, uh, as Hilti Expeditors and UTI. Uh, he has been uh, uh, handling assignments encompassing the world range of supply services from consulting, international freight management, 3PL, express, transportation, et cetera. Uh, his, his competence spreads across transaction domains, uh, industrial logistics and land services, where he's currently in CBRE, he's uh, uh, heading, he's take, giving this overall direction strategy and growth for the ILS vertical in India for CBRE. Uh, he leads the business development and account management initiative for this vertical uh, with a multidisciplinary exposure and experience. Uh, he has won and managed varied assignments, uh, including leasing of built to suit industrial and logistics assets, uh, express dis distribution centers, repair and return facilities, as well as acquisition and deposition of plan. Uh, welcome Jasmine for uh, this session. Uh, we look forward to seeing your uh, presentations and your talk on the topic. Uh, I have uh, with us, uh, um, uh, in the world of uh, logistics, e-commerce plays a big role, and we have one of the e-commerce giants also here. Uh, so uh, most welcome, uh, Mr. Gopala Krishna, uh, National Head Supply Chain from Big Basket. Uh, Mr. Gopala Krishna, for almost 14 years of experience in supply chain and out of eight years dedicated in e-commerce warehousing, uh, he is expert in getting uh, developing the supply chain infras and strategies, inventory management and transport management. Uh, he's an uh, uh, alumni of uh, Nagarjuna University. Welcome, Mr. Uh, Gopala Krishna. Uh, we have, uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, privileged to uh, welcome Mr. Devendra Rawat uh, from uh, Director Levi Stratus and Company. Uh, and when you, when you go through his uh, experience and resume, you have only wow. Uh, so he has almost uh, more than two decades of experience uh, in operations and supply chain uh, in India and internationally. Uh, I think except for uh, South America and North America, the rest of the continents he has already worked on. Uh, and uh, he has worked both in the consulting as well as in the industry. He's a people leader who believes in empowered teams working together and achieving targets. Um, his experience includes both in organized retail as well as e-commerce. He is expert Flipkart, when I understand, and uh, currently with Larry's. He has also worked in the FMCG industry with PepsiCo, Marico, and also with durables like uh, Bridgestone and Apollo Tires. Uh, he has also a great uh, half a decade of uh, consulting experience with uh, McKenzie uh, and ENY. Uh, he's an alumni of uh, IM Calcutta. 
uh, and, uh, and, and a mechanical engineer by qualification. He's currently, uh, as I mentioned, director at Steris, uh, Levi's Steris and Com Company. He takes care of planning and logistics for India, South Asia, Middle East, and North Africa. Uh, geography. He's a member of a geo leadership team before Levis. He was with 3M uh, for a few years and supply chain and sourcing head for all businesses for India region. Prior to 3M, he was with Flipkart in a planning function for supply chain division. Uh, what a diverse uh, experience and I'm sure uh, the, uh, the audience will uh, learn a lot from your uh, session uh, and talk. I have somebody from the technology side also for the warehouse, uh, and uh, that's Mr. Ashok Kumar, head intra logistics from Godrej Storage Solution. He has more than two decades of experience uh, in techno commercial uh, sales supply chain uh, and logistics engineering and process design. And that's very important in a warehouse uh, logistics design and process engineering, uh, distribution and manufacturing logistics. Uh, uh, he has delivered more than 40 logistics engineered projects. Uh, covering all kind of industry segments. Uh, he has been instrumental in delivering re-engineered warehouse processes and systems to uh, many multinational clients. Uh, he's heading the initiative of creating new verticals for consulting such as gold chain, in, uh, pole chain infra planning, greenhouse, green warehouse, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, currently he's working towards integrating intelligence into warehouse and that's one area where uh, something can be done and make the warehouses sustainable. Prior to joining Godridge, he was with IT hardware, ITS, and flexible packaging companies. Uh, so welcome, Mr. Ashok Kumar, to this session. Uh, last, not but the least, and uh, another impressive uh, uh, profile sitting in front of me. Uh, welcome, Ankit. Uh, Ankit Samadria is head of asset management with Logos Properties. Uh, Ankit is uh, in real, a real estate uh, investment and asset management, a professional uh, who has uh, worked more than a decade uh, uh, in India, United States, and uh, in Southeast Asia, primarily in Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, Ankit leads asset management for Logos, uh, a leading APAC-focused integrated logistics real estate firm backed by ARA Asset Management in India. Uh, prior to working with Logos, uh, Ankit was working with Zender Group, so always having the money to invest somewhere. Uh, Ankit, and in his role from 2013 to 2020, Ankit advised groups on uh, strategic initiatives and uh, investments across real estate assets classes. Uh, prior to joining Zender, he worked uh, also in Shell uh, across US, the Netherlands, and Singapore, and Malaysia. And what I know about Shell, they are one of the best in organizing their supply chain and logistics uh, intra-city or inter-city. Um, uh, he has been uh, also involved in internal strategy consulting teams with International Finance Corporation. Uh, Ankit is a alumni of IIT Delhi and Harvard Business School. Uh, so welcome Ankit uh, to this session. We look forward to uh, talking to you and seeing you. Uh, coming to the topic uh, today, uh, uh, sustainable warehouse uh, infrastructure and also a world-class infrastructure. And I think both world-class infrastructure and sustainability can go hand in hand. And sustainability is uh, not only a topic which we have to uh, do, but it's I think it's our responsibility as our generation if we want to uh, hand over a, a right condition of planet to the next generations coming and uh, uh, United Nations did set a strategy, uh, strategic development, uh, sustainability development goals for 2030, 17 goals, and which gives a good guidelines for uh, uh, any industry to move in the sustainable manner. Uh, but uh, the questions today we have is why sustainable warehouses and how we can uh, develop those and incorporate technology into it and uh, how responsible we can be. So we'll be hearing all those uh, uh, in the next one, one and a half hours. I request all the audience that when you are hearing all these, please use the chat box in the, in the, in the, in the uh, display in front of you chat box for the Zoom meeting and keep putting your questions. Uh, request that when you're putting the question, put your name and your organization and the question, that will be great help. But don't wait till the session ends, keep, getting your questions uh, flow in and we will take the questions later. Uh, so going forward, I'll not waste time uh, and uh, I'll hand over uh, uh, the uh, speaker, the mic to uh, Mr. Rajiv Mehta who will uh, give his views on this. 
uh, Mr. Rajiv Mehta. Yeah, very good afternoon. In fact, uh, before the this whole thing started, we were discussing. When I have not prepared any slides, but I'll share my experience. Uh, I come from an industry where uh, you know between ACC and Ambuja combined, we handle near about 900 distribution centers. And uh, the problem with this business is it's a low cost, uh, low value, and a high logistic cost business. So every time the pressure is on that, you must optimize the cost. And of course, warehousing becomes one of the element of that. But uh, last one and a half year, if I would like to share, there is a complete change in the whole process. Where I say that uh, besides cost is one element of it, what we have now decided, we will go for customized warehouses now and henceforth with long-term relationship with the business associates. It is not possible to tell anybody to invest in a good warehouse when you go for a one or two year contract. So the contract duration is getting changed that it has to be minimum five years to 10 years, depending on your business assessment and all that. So that is one big change which is happening that you have to join hands with your business associates. Second thing which we observed in last couple of years, post COVID situation, there were no manual labor. Cement per se used to be handled by manual labors and there were no labors around, which resulted in material obsolescence and many other problems also. So the decision was that how can we mechanize all those warehouses? And that is only possible when you have got some long-term contract and customization of your warehouses. You cannot do otherwise. So that is one big change which is happening that all warehouses are getting mechanized. Of course, it is not happening overnight, but the process has begun. So we want to minimize the intervention of manual labor as far as warehousing is concerned. That is the part two. Third, in terms of the health and safety, Earlier, the warehouses were typical, uh, you know, warehouses where I have no hesitation in accepting that adequate attention was not paid to health and safety part of the workers. After this COVID situation, the social distancing norms, other norms, now we are making it mandatory that there should be adequate h and protocol at every warehouse. There should be proper restrooms. There should be other facilities, required medical facilities. All those things are getting prominence as far as warehouse management is concerned. So these were a few things which were completely missing like mechanization, long-term long contracting, health and safety part. All these things have now become integral part of it. And uh, when I look at the cost part of it, you know, there is something called cost versus contribution. And rather than looking at only the rental part of it, we have to look at that what you save in terms of the material integrity, less obsolescence, less handling cost. If I combine all these things, I think we have to look in totality rather than looking only at the rental part of the warehouse. Because majority of the time, what happens that we negotiate warehouses in different ways that first you negotiate rent, then you negotiate something else, then you negotiate something else. So I think uh, the time now has come to look at things in totality, that what you are gaining out of good quality warehouses and what you are losing out of that. So these are the major changes which are happening. But I think to conclude, I would like to say only one thing that a long-term clear vision about warehousing is mandatory for every organization and customization is key of the whole process. That's all from my side. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mehta. Very precise and very sharp. And I think uh, the point which you mentioned about uh, cement low value, high logistics cost, I believe cement and steel are having one of the highest logistics cost in terms of uh, the commodities uh, in our country. Uh, but also, I think uh, one point which you mentioned about cost versus value was uh, very good. And I could see Ankit and uh, Jasmine smiling on that. Uh, uh, but uh, I think, uh, and health and safety is, is a responsibility of every single person uh, 
in the world. And I think if we take care of health and safety, all the other things keep, keep falling in place. Uh, uh, so uh, request once again to audience that keep posting your questions. Uh, I, I'll keep, keep chasing for the questions over here. Uh, going forward next, I would request uh, uh, Jasmine Singh to uh, take over and uh, give his views uh, and we'll take the questions, uh, uh, keep sending the questions and we'll take the questions in the end. Uh, questions if you have for Mr. Mehta or for any of the panelists. Uh, thank you so much, Nepin. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, 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 perfectly. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mehta for setting the context. I think uh, uh, Nitin rightly noticed that I and uh, uh, Ankit were probably the happiest ones when we're looking at clients who are saying we are willing to commit on a long-term basis. Uh, just to give the audience a flavor of where we are, I think much as the topic is around sustainable and green warehousing, as we as we call it today, but I think let's look at the sector as a whole. The sector today has exploded like never before. This was probably the only asset class in the real estate sector which has done well. It has sustained the momentum and it has also grown as compared to any other asset class post the pandemic. So 2020 and 2021, this asset class has been the most sought after asset class by investors, developers and occupiers alike. Uh, the, the growth might have been tapered last year by, by causes that Mr. Mehta elaborated because of a shortage of labor, et cetera, because nobody was planning for a lockdown which would extend to such a long period of time. But this year, even despite the lockdown, the construction has carried on full swing. If you look at the sector in totality, and let's look at the buildings which can be moved into the green space or buildings which can be classified as a grade A building, uh, one of our reports captured that we did about 32 million square feet of fresh grade A modern world-class warehousing infrastructure in the year 2019. And then 2020 hit us. Uh, happy to announce to the entire audience who's there on the call that the sector will probably bounce back and do a 40 million plus number next year, which means not only have we basically defied the pundits who were, who were saying that it's going to be a doomsday scenario for the warehousing sector. Uh, the logistics players extensively backed by the e-commerce industry, which has shown a phenomenal growth, has actually lapped up space like never before. What has happened in the process is that the demand for better, more efficient warehouses has come into play. One thing that, that we have seen is that uh, sizes have improved. Your consumption patterns have improved. Your, your clients who are our clients are actually taking more space as, as compared to, uh, let's say, five years back or 10 years back. Uh, Ecom is leading the space. 3PLs are right behind. Other sectors are also looking at modernization, optimization. They are working on network scheduling. What has happened in the entire process is that people are looking at more efficient building. People don't want more space. People want a better throughput from the same size that they were using before, which essentially leads to the creation of a world-class infrastructure. A part of it would be sustainable and green warehousing. I personally believe, and having spent some time on the supply chain side, that there is only so much that you can do to optimize the cost of warehousing within the operations inside a warehouse. So you can, you can look at your inventory management processes, you can look at your certifications, you can look at your processes. But I think overall, a basic concept of one design fits all has suddenly gone to trash. More and more clients are coming in and asking for a layout plan which is tailor-made for their operations. So a retail operations guy would ask for a design which will help him optimize and get a better throughput uh, as compared to a normal 3PL who's managing inventory for 10 different brands. Uh, Ecom has a different layout plan. So their aspect ratios are different. Their binning standards are different. Their grid structures are different. And I think because of global compliances, because people are waking up, the waking up to the fact that they have to give it back to the economy, I think more and more people are looking at certified buildings. Now, these certifications are coming in both from uh, a, a green standard perspective. So you have LEED standards, you have IGBC standards. But as Mr. Mehta rightly pointed out, 
all this comes at a cost. So the, the supply chain head and the management has to think about a higher investment in the initial phase of this life cycle of taking a warehouse on lease or building a green building to which is going to probably pay back in about a 10 year span or a 12 year span versus taking a non-certified, a non-green building and saving money in the short to medium run. I personally believe a lot of multinationals now are waking up to the fact that they need to invest as a part of their global culture, as a part of their compliance process. And much as the cost is going up, people are opting for certified buildings. Uh, and that's a positive change. And that's a positive change because this can only be done by developers with deep pockets. Much as the government of India is investing heavily onto the expansion of the national highways, doing the Sagar Malas of the world, uh, building up dedicated freight corridors, but they are not building infrastructure on the warehousing side or the industrial side for occupiers to come in and occupy. They're giving you land to build. This development is done by private partners, which slowly and steadily, like any other asset class, are becoming institutional in nature. So gone are the days that you would have HNIs building warehouses to be leased by the Levi Strauss, uh, the boomers of the world, or the Amazons of the world. I think more and more funding is coming in into creation of large integrated industrial and logistics parks by foreign funds, which are institutional in nature, which could be sovereign, private equity, so on and so forth. But they would only come in if there is scale, if there is a demand for quality and clients are willing to commit on a long-term basis. So one topic with Mr. Mehta positively touched on our behalf was that clients are today willing to sign in for a lock-in period of more than three years or five years, sign 15-year leases and 30-year leases. And I think the advent of e -com and the growth of e -com has also led to a sustainable growth by these partners coming in and pouring in billions of dollars into this environment. Uh, so that's that's on a macro level what I what I feel is happening in the industry. It's a positive sign. It is good not just for the environment. It is good for the society because all these improvements, whether use of uh, solar panels to create captive energy, whether it is uh, rainwater harvesting, whether it is uh, doing other uh, items of uh, let's say a better floor plan, better grid structure, uh, creating more optimal warehouses. It is leading to efficiency, but it is leading to a new industry, which is creating jobs for the Indians. It is, it is a separate set of the economy, which is growing like never before. So I think overall, it has it is not only creating a sustainable environment for the future generations, it is also creating a whole lot of employment opportunities for people to actually get involved in and, and uh, create employment. Uh, that, according to me, is in a nutshell what, what we can do. We can go into the brass tacks of what are the what are the what are the things that you need to do, uh, but from controlling noise pollution to doing optimal temperature control, both for products and employees in the warehouses, optimal use of solar, hydro, wherever possible, looking at alternate uh, mechanisms, everything is possible. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer for the calls or answer answer questions if the audience throws them my way. But that in a nutshell is my take on why this is important and how this is getting affected in the real time. And that's it from my senator. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, glad to hear that uh, logistics was the industry which kept on growing even in these uh, tough times. And as they say, logistics is a sunrise industry in India, not only uh, in terms of the warehousing space, but also for the employment and all. Uh, the numbers were great, uh, uh, the 40 million plus grade A, uh, buildings which will keep coming. Uh, and one thing which was common, which Mr. Mehta also said that the warehouses have to be customized to the need. And that's what you also mentioned that one design fit all does not work uh, anymore and you need to. And one point which was very really good that uh, funding is available as long as you're willing to commit to long-term and quality and international standards and there is funding. And I think that's a cue to many of the people who want to get into the warehouses uh, occupy the space. Uh, I think it's available, it's possible. And one thing which I could uh, get from the, your talk is that we have moved from godowns to warehouses now in, in some sense. Uh, so godowns are history now and we are talking about now warehouses. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, going forward, uh, I have Mr. Gopalakrishna from uh, Big Basket. Uh, uh, 
So, uh, Mr. Gopalakrishna, over to you. Uh, thanks, Nitin. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. I hope, Nitin, my voice is clear. Yeah, I can. Uh, we can hear you well. Uh, you will be sharing the screen. Uh... No, no. I will talk about. Thanks, thanks, Nitin. Good evening, all. Uh, so, uh, in my experience of the last uh, fourteen years, I worked in three uh, uh, PL. I worked in uh, retail industry. In the last uh, uh, seven eight years, I'm working in e-commerce. So, what I realized uh, is, uh, it's a warehousing is completely. Uh, different in all these industries and now recently what i what i what we found from the last seven eight years since i'm in uh, the uh, e-commerce industry standardization in the warehouses which is actually it is giving more uh, sustainability and more to do with the uh, less uh, in warehousing so one if you standardize and design well in our warehouses, then actually we are able to uh, uh, do more with less. What we found in the last one and a half year in these pandemic situations, how can we do more uh, with less? I mean, we have to serve to the more customers. How we can able to do? Then what we realized is these standardizations is actually it has helped us to do uh, more and sustainable uh, in this long run. Even we didn't face much problem in even in the uh, first pandemic situation in Corona, or even now, that that's one thing I really uh, understood uh, in this warehousing. Second, uh, I agree with uh, Jasmine. Uh, as and when you do uh, uh, the the long run uh, relationship with partners or uh, land owners, uh, so that that's that's where actually we are able to build the uh, great design uh, in in the warehousing sectors and the long relationship will definitely sustain our operations and standardizations. Uh, second uh, key uh, observation of mine in this warehousing is that uh, reduction in the cost of energy, uh, it can be in terms of solar. Actually, most of our uh, facilities, we use uh, solar. Actually, that is helping a lot in uh, warehousing to sustain and reduce the cost, obviously. And the uh, second, in terms of uh, use LED, use natural lighting, when you build the warehouses in the long term, so obviously we can build the great infra. Most of our facilities is built to suit. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's where we standardize or we make, make sure that turbo ventilators or LED lightings, uh, or even for the uh, movement of the logistics also uh, try to use more into uh, EVs, EV vehicles. That's the uh, trend now. Even we use our last mile uh, currently, most of the vehicles in, uh, uh, I mean, mostly more than 2000 vans we have in uh, EV system. So uh, uh, I'm talking about starting from warehousing to the uh, end of uh, delivery. So how much have we uh, uh, reduce uh, utilization of uh, other things and use the natural uh, natural energy that will really help. And the second part in the warehousing, uh, what I uh, uh, what I understood from the last couple of years is that how much ever you you are able to digitalize our warehousing processes and with using the technology, so that will really change the game uh, in the digitalizing or using the technology. Uh, starting from any of your our processes, it can be inbound management, outbound management, or inventory management. So that's where actually the the idea of uh, doing more with less space is actually we will sustain more and reduce the cost uh, in terms of cost and benefits. And uh, in the challenges in this uh, this we are talking about green warehousing and all. There is a lot of restrictions that we need to come out uh, when we trying to use the solar in most of the places. There will be some challenges and uh, uh, some restrictions from the regularities using 100% capacities and seasonal elements need to be looked at. And when it comes to the logistics, again, same challenges, uh, uh, charging points 
uh, so this EV, we provide many of uh, our facilities have this charging part. So these are all some of the challenges, but I'm sure we can come out with the challenges in future. A lot of benefits in sustainable uh, warehousing. Uh, if, if you do these three, four actions, uh, I'm sure we'll be able to deliver, uh, reduce a lot of delivery costs, or reuse our resources more better. And as well as the key part is the last one and a half year, what we learned is uh, employees has to be happy and safe workplace. That's the key, right? So when you do this uh, build to suit or as per our standards, then definitely uh, these all can be managed uh, well. Uh, in the future, uh, I'm sure uh, increasing in energy storages and uh, electrical uh, electric vehicles or save energy and water. These are all will definitely cut down the cost and sustainability will be much, much better uh, is what I feel. Yeah, that's all I can from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anand. Uh, keywords. Uh standardize uh, and uh, build to suit and i think uh, you are echo you echoed the same um, points which uh, mr Mehta and mr singh also said and i think if we want to have a sustainable warehouse and uh, cost optimized warehousing cost optimized logistics it has to be standardized it has to be built for long term uh, and it's not just the reduction uh, in few places but also have to look into uh, a reduction through solar and other things. And for sure, the challenges uh, will be there. Uh, and uh, I think uh, um, CII could consolidate all those challenges and put forward to the policy makers, uh, whatever challenges are felt in the from the regulatory side. Uh, and the benefits on the re reduce, reuse, and uh, in the end, one of the best part is happy and healthy workplace. And I think that's what everybody looks forward to it. Uh, thank you so much for your points. Uh, I request now Mr. Devendra Rawat to uh, give his presentation. Uh, so maybe Mr. Rawat, you can share your screen uh, with your slides. Yeah, I'll just try. I'll just do that. Yeah. So thanks, thanks, Nitin. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Gopal, uh, Rajiv, and Mr. Jasmine Singh for a very insightful talk. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, all the viewers. Uh, I do have some slides to share, so let me just. Uh, Sort out the tech part first. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen. We can see your screen. Okay, great. Great, good. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, talking about sustainability, uh, sustainability in warehousing. And I've also added, you know, sustainability in our lives. Uh, because uh, believe me, uh, last 10 years working with companies like PepsiCo, 3M, uh, now Levi's, uh, and also Flipkart in between, I am really, uh, you know, uh, breathing sustainability, living sustainability, wearing sustainable clothes. So it has really, really become uh, uh, becoming a key part of our lives. Uh, and I felt it apt to put the picture of a rising sun uh, behind it, because uh, while the warehousing industry, as Mr. Uh, as Nitin said, is the rising industry. I think sustainability is the further, you know, it's it's really the it's really on the rise uh, as of now, and all of us in the industry are are experiencing that. Uh, so I'll I'll just move uh, uh, just 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 talking about sustainability as the new normal. Uh, I uh, I think that's where we are really heading. I mean, even if we are not there, we'll be there soon. Uh, it's really everyone in the world is talking about it, and we can't be, uh, you know, away from that. Uh, whether it's about products or process practices or infrastructure, and and of course we are today talking about warehouse infrastructure. But sustainability is is getting all encompassed, right? So uh, I work with Levi's right now. Uh, the products that we make, uh, there is so much of research going into uh, getting uh, products, you know, all these clothes, making getting them more sustainable. How can they reuse less water, zero water, less chemicals, zero chemicals? Uh, there is a there is a huge uh, sustainability has a huge play. And if you today walk into a Levi's showroom, you will see sustainability as a big uh, you know call out out there. Uh, products which have been made in with, with much more sustainable uh, practices. 
uh, are are prominently displayed, and that's because even the consumer cares, right? So the society at large, the consumers at large, are caring about uh, how you are caring for the environment, how you are making things more sustainable. Uh, all of that uh, is becoming, uh, like I said earlier, becoming an important part of our lives. Uh, uh, coming to infrastructure, of course, uh, that's something which uh, uh, is what we have been discussing, and that's uh, uh, sustainability. Into that is 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 definitely a key, uh, you know, key element there. Uh, yeah, so what I'm showing here is, uh, I would really call them as the key pillars of sustainability, uh, especially uh, focusing now more on uh, when we are looking at making sustainable uh, warehouse infrastructure, uh, environmental sustainability, uh, process sustainability, and, and human sustainability. And I, I know we have uh, touched upon all of this in some way or the other during our discussion still now. Uh, environmental, of course, uh, uh, energy, water, waste, uh, we have talked about these. Uh, uh, how do you, you know, let more natural light, natural air, ventilation, insulation, I mean, all of them, those have been the components uh, to look at. Uh, water, uh, whether it is about water usage or water harvesting, uh, uh, rainwater harvesting, so all of those are important part there. Waste, uh, waste again, waste management, waste disposal uh, becomes, becomes a key. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, even material sustainability is is a is an upcoming uh, top you know uh, aspect now. Uh, so Levi's is uh, Levi's Strauss uh, is actually building a DC in Europe. Uh, it's going to get commissioned soon in Germany, and that's being uh, touted as the most sustainable DC in Europe, most sustainable warehouse in Europe. Uh, what is unique about that is that other than all of these elements. Uh, even all the material being used in construction, the material being used in making the offices is such that uh, it is, uh, when you decommission the warehouse, you know, even, even after 20 years, if you are uh, doing something uh, with the roofing or with, the, with any other element of the warehouse uh, infra, uh, the, the material being used is all uh, in, uh, environmentally you know, friendly, it's, it's sustainable. So, uh, so that's the extent to which you know, the world is now moving and talking about it and, and and of course all this is uh, is also happening like i said because uh, uh, companies do feel the need to to go there uh, to create uh, uh, and 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 that image obviously helps but that image comes with with a lot of work around it uh, to, to 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 you know be uh, called as the responsible organization the sustainable organization right uh, uh, when we talk about process sustainability, of course, how do we make the processes more efficient? How do we make them, uh, you know, a good WMS system will not only help you in working more efficiently, but it will also help in uh, reducing the, 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 say, the fuel uh, which the forklift would use or, you know, reducing the energy consumption. Uh, so all of those are important aspects also to be looked at. Uh, you might be doing well without a good WMS system, uh, but then look at the don't only look at the efficiency savings or the cost of WMS, but uh, at the same time, like I said, you know, look at it also from the ultimate impact on environment that that will have, right? Uh, simplification of processes, uh, automation uh, uh, of, of, uh, of processes is all about, uh, you know, making the process sustainable. And we have touched upon this uh, uh, when Gopala was talking about uh, COVID. Uh, of course, COVID has been a big eye opener uh, for all of us and uh, how uh, the labor shortage led to a lot of issues in the industry and hence uh, how automation can really help, you know, overcome uh, a lot of that. So I think that's, that's all about, uh, you know, making your processes sustainable. Uh, human sustainability, again, I think COVID is something which has really, really raised the bar on that. Uh, Many companies are now going for, uh, you know, sponsoring the vaccination of their employees, ensuring that, uh, you know, people are healthy uh, uh, because uh, everyone has realized how important it is to, to have a safe and health, healthy workplace uh, to continue uh, having your, you know, even just for the business continuity, I would say, right? So, uh, so human uh, sustainability is, uh, again, a very, very important pillar. And, uh, and and this this is what you need to do really to to achieve your financial success uh, to achieve your operation sustainability. 
So, uh, so I would really, really would say that, you know, as you are designing your warehouse, as you are looking at how you would uh, uh, get your work done in the warehouse, look at environmental sustainability, process sustainability, human sustainability, and these three aspects uh, should really help you in uh, getting to a stage where you can really call your uh, entire uh, warehousing operations as sustainable. Yeah. Uh, so, so what's really the journey, uh, you know, I would really call sustainability as a journey. Uh, and all of us understand that uh, probably even 10 years back or probably even five years back, it was not really so much in focus. Uh, last few years have really been a game changer in getting the uh, sustainability, warehousing sustainability up. Uh, we heard a lot about manufacturing earlier. Uh, now the same focus is coming to the distribution as well. Uh, the the short-term cost focus though still remains a challenge. Uh, we are not running away from that. Uh, but companies are realizing more and more, and uh, we had touched upon that that you know uh, building sustainability in operations, building sustainability in warehousing is something for for long term. And if you really want to be efficient in long term, uh, some of the short-term costs you will have to incur. Uh, it's being driven very strongly by uh, some of the large Indian organizations. I think Tata's are uh, companies like Mahindra, et cetera, are doing great work there. Uh, E-commerce, of course, I think e-commerce uh, has really brought a totally different uh, view, totally different world into warehousing and logistics, and that's also helping in making it more sustainable. Uh, in the middle of pandemic, uh, e-commerce uh, kept booming last year as well as this year. Uh, for us, as a as an as in, uh, as in, uh, you know, as a manufacturing organization, we have seen how much e-commerce has helped us in sustaining sales even during the pandemic, when there have been, uh, when offline channels have been uh, uh, under lockdowns, uh, and that really, uh, you know, shows the need that e-com uh, needs to have in for sustainable operations, uh, and of course MNCs. Uh, I think uh, Jasmine touched upon this that a lot of MNCs are now looking at. Uh, you know, becoming more sustainable in the warehousing. I think, I think probably it's also driven by one more change, uh, which I have just mentioned here. Uh, and my personal experience in, uh, uh, like I said, in PepsiCo and 3M and now Levi's has been that uh, in last uh, decade or so, organizations have gone more functional, and the reportings have also become, you know, uh, gone into more, uh, more, more functional reporting, uh, because they do want to leverage the uh, strength of the function. So when I was in 3M, I was earlier uh, 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 reporting to the head of the India business, and that actually changed into uh, head of uh, Asia supply chain, who in turn was reporting into global supply chain. So global supply chain became a stronger, more integrated function, and the same thing happened with other functions also. But one of the impact of this uh, reorganization that many MNCs are going through is that then you get you become part of a team which then looks at you know beyond India and and looks at uh, you know, uh, it uh, in a in, you know looks at other countries, and to be honest, uh, when first time first time this change happened in 3M, and uh, we looked at all the distribution centers, all the warehouses uh, across Asia, and mapped them on various parameters, uh, we in India were not really doing that great on some of these you know uh, KPIs uh, related to uh, related to sustainability. In fact, uh, if I if I uh, uh, if I may add that, you know, five, six years back, it was actually difficult to even find good warehouses uh, with uh, with a good, uh, uh, say, a sprinkler system or a water hydrant system itself. Yeah, and, uh, but then uh, when we uh, looked at it and when there was a, uh, you know, overall discussion and, and a direction to go more uh, sustainable, to look at, you know, really, really improve the standards of safety, uh, and uh, the way the warehouses are designed, uh, sustainability, etc. Uh, then uh, uh, things have changed, uh, and warehouses. You know, a lot of MNCs have also moved the locations. They have gone into places which are giving them, uh, you know, much more sustainable operations. Uh, and of course, it's uh, this journey has just begun. It needs an entire ecosystem, uh, and you know, a lot of. Uh, if you see how things have really changed in the last five years, I think a, a lot of organizations now, the logistics partners, are coming up with, uh, you know, with all the logistics parks coming up, 
uh, coming up with these uh, uh, options uh, available for the companies uh, who can now look at uh, making their operations you know a lot more sustainable and i think the government has also uh, definitely uh, uh, helping on in this area uh, if i see in fact some of the news clippings i have put which are probably last month or couple of months only uh, government has announced a national logistics excellence award uh, you know the multimodal logistics parks etc which are being conceived uh, green energy focus on green clean energy which is coming more from uh, the transport ministry so i think a lot of this is uh, uh, is then creating that entire ecosystem and when you have government thinking alike the logistics partners thinking alike and companies like us thinking about this uh, then definitely this this sustainability journey uh, is going to move forward and i think that's a great change we are witnessing uh, personally i would say i'm extremely happy to see uh, things moving in this direction uh, i think this is something where uh, when i compare india and uh, with the western world and i've worked in uh, uh, in in europe i've worked in southeast asia i i see how things there are i would say that uh, this is an area where we were really lacking i really liked it when uh, nitin said that we are now moving finally moving from go down to a warehouse right so uh, really putting it i would say very nicely uh, there uh, so uh, so yeah and i think i think this journey uh, needs to continue uh, we need to keep driving focus on this uh we as the supply chain uh, functional uh, managers in the organizations need to also uh be the advocate of this and you know with the larger organization uh, in front of the ceos uh, need to uh, push for this need to make them understand how why sustainable warehousing is important uh why we need to have uh, uh, sustainable operations uh, and why if there is a short term money to be spent on this then why why is that important Right, so that's what I would say. Uh, thanks. That's what I have. Thank you, Mr. Rawat. Uh, I think uh, I, I liked the whole sentence when you said sustainability has to be part of our life, and I think that's a must. Uh, that's not an option. That's a must. And uh, you're giving reference and example also of the sustainable clothes, and I think it's very important that we are not creating waste. And there is a circular economy. Uh, just not a sustainability but also a circular economy that things are going back into uh, action and i mean, you you mentioned uh, uh, thanks for mentioning these three killer, uh, key pillars of uh, um, sustainability environment process and uh, human and and the bottom line which you mentioned was very right that these are key pillars but that that will de de deliver or drive your functional and operational sustainability and that's so rightly put I, I noted down a few catalysts you mentioned, which is moving the warehousing in the right direction. One was COVID, which moved into automation and uh, health and safety environment, which became a catalyst. And also one catalyst, which you mentioned, which I uh, never thought of earlier, that the change in the organizations from the line function to this matrix or a functional reporting, uh, where you could benchmark and you start playing on a global uh, uh, ground rather than in a, your silo. Uh, thanks for um, uh, your views. Uh, I'm starting to get questions, good questions, and uh, we'll take it in the end. Uh, going forward, thank you once again, Mr. Rawat. And going forward, I uh, request Mr. Ashok Kumar to share his presentation and share his view and the technology side. Uh, you are mute. Uh, you have to unmute. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, am I audible clearly here? Yeah. 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 Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon, Chairperson. Uh, good afternoon, uh, esteemed delegates. Uh, good afternoon, the audience. Okay, uh, so while I have uh, no certain external view of on sustainability, uh, but most of my presentation would revolve uh, on the basis of uh, an inside-out view. Okay, uh, so please pardon me if it gets a little too technical for you, uh, but I will try to keep it as simple as possible for your liking. Uh, so let me share my uh, screen. Is this visible? Not yet. How it now, sir? No. Just a second. Maybe a colleague from uh, CII can share, Riaz or John. Not a problem, sir. Not a problem, sir. How it now, sir? Yeah, yeah. Not coming. Starting. 
Yeah, it's there. You can. Yeah, we can see this. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about sustainable warehousing more from the warehousing technologies perspective. Okay. Uh, so uh, when I talk about warehousing technologies, uh, looking at the core competencies of uh, Godridge Group, I will focus uh, my presentation more on storage and material handling uh, systems. So what are we talking about is these two systems uh, broadly speaking. So when we look at sustainability measures in storage systems, uh, so what we could see is, see what you what you'll be seeing in my presentation is uh, more of a you know what is currently there. Are we uh, are we already there in terms of sustainability with regard to warehousing technology? Is what you are going to see. So from a storage system perspective, what I am going to present to you is how sustainability is driven using certain approaches uh, by the industry players. One uh, of the approach. I think uh, we lost uh, Mr. Ashok Kumar. We, we are not able to get uh, your voice and the video. Mr. Ashok Kumar? Yeah, have I joined back? No. Yes, you are. You, can, you are able to see me? Voice is breaking. <clears throat> voice is breaking. Just a second. What about the presentation, sir? Uh, right now, we can't see the presentation. Just a second. Yeah, now we can see. Uh, maybe you'll have to. Is it good, sir, now? Yeah, it's there, but your voice is breaking. So okay. maybe you can switch off your video. The bandwidth becomes a little better. And maybe you can run a little faster. I think that's all. Yeah, my video is already stopped. So should I continue? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. It says my internet connection is a little unstable. Okay. Okay. So I was talking about certain approaches. Uh, manufacturing process is one. Then how uh, you no know, we are helping the users adopt to good practices in warehousing. How do we make sure that the systems are continuously available to people through audit and maintenance? So these are the approaches uh, which the players adopt to ensure uh, sustainability. Now let me touch upon them each, uh, each one. So when it comes to the choice of material, uh, particularly the raw material uh, for the storage system, essentially it is steel and paint are the major uh, cost components. So when we talk about steel, uh, we are essentially moving into ROHS compliant steels and the paints are of course uh, lead free paints. So this is a direction in which the industry is moving. And when we look at accessories like batteries, motors, circuits that are being used in dynamic storage systems, uh, the battery technology is obviously moving from lead acid to lithium, uh, lithium ion batteries. And the, uh, and the other components like electrical components like motors, circuits are moving towards ROHS compliance. And when it comes to designing of storage systems, I mean, now there is a consistency in following global codes to bring in standard set of uh, systems in place. So when you look at global codes, obviously the different players play, uh, no, follow different uh, standards. Is one of the market, uh, as the market leader follows European norms uh, when it comes to the design. But the design is essentially driving how do we consume optimal level of steel and real benefit that we are targeting to pres uh, preserve precious metal like uh, steel and also to look at how to give the maximum life period for the storage system and ensure uninterrupted operations which can deliver business results for our customers. So this is where the design is being driven into. And when we look at design aspect on this more on the safety, there are specific components that come into play to ensure that the products have longer life. They are continuously delivering. Like, no, how do I prevent 
the interact frequent interactions happening between of an impact even if it is accidental how do we ensure the material is kept in a balanced manner how how do, how can we prevent it from falling from a high waste storage because today we talk about taller warehouses multiple levels of storage so the safety is assuming more uh, importance in warehousing so how the design is being driven towards ensuring these safety features people safety material safety is also important so our design is being driven towards developing components that ensure safety for people for material in warehouse and create a, an uninterrupted operation now while these products are being offered to give a sustainable warehousing practice the product itself is being manufactured through a sustainable manufacturing practice no so uh, if somebody like our, our manufacturing we use etp and sd facilities to control our discharges we make make use of vermicomposting for no treating our uh, uh, treating our waste so that the what waste we let out into the environment is minimal we also look at users because our experience is no amount of technology that you may be talking about unless otherwise the users adopt to those technologies in the correct way you are not going to get the benefits so it it's not good if the investor is thinking about it it's not uh, about the sellers thinking about it the users have to ultimately adopt it so what practices that are that we are seeing and that we are following are consultative design so that you know, we we co create solutions with our with our users with our customers so that whatever solution that gets ultimately invested upon has the highest degree of adoption we also understand that this industry is evolving over a period of time and there is still a lot amount of low skilled labor being associated with warehousing and hence we are uh, we are in, uh, getting into various programs which are towards creating awareness about safety towards uh, creating awareness towards good practices uh, programs to develop proper skills for using the uh, assets Uh, these are all the practices that we are following that is being seen in the market auditing services have found acceptance today uh, what does auditing services do it primarily identify risks for the customers and obviously the risks are not all risks are bad so the classic uh, the auditing service also help in classifying the risk as to what is to be actioned upon what is not to be actioned upon suggest corrective actions as to what you should do in what time frame that's what auditing services uh, doing as precisely what as a practice we also do uh, when it comes to uh, maintenance of systems traditionally speaking storage systems never required any maintenance but with the extensive use of metal handling equipments in warehouses uh, and with the accidental contact coming in place uh, between racks and metal handling equipments maintenance becomes one critical element so life cycle services as a business option also has emerged as a necessity for warehouses has emerged life cycle services are primarily aimed at maintaining the systems as a preventive way in a preventive manner realign configurations because businesses are changing over a period of time very rapidly so how to realign using the same existing infrastructure and ex extend the usable life period am i supposed to make fresh investment all the time or can be past investments can be made use of for my future use so these are all the aspects the life cycle services are today touching upon now while these are the sustainability measures on storage systems there are a different set of sustainability measures that are happening in the metal handling systems area what are they we are seeing a huge drive of electrification of trucks the forklifts are getting more and more of the electric nature and also considering that there is a wide range of operations in warehousing electrical equipments are being designed for specific functions specific applications even within the warehouse to avoid stressed over stressed use of any one particular type of equipment there are innovations happening with regard to the fuel uh, technology there are designs which are focused on controlling emissions from the equipments if you have no if you have no choice but to use diesel forklifts there are safety accessories to ensure to minimize man machine conflict there are obviously operator training on equipments because equipments are all heavy metal handling equipments are heavy equipments they can cause very severe damage 
either to the storage systems or to people or to the infrastructure. So operator training is very, very important. So that is gaining uh, popularity. And obviously maintenance, which is a very common thing uh, from the day one, as far as metal handling equipment are concerned. Now, when we talk about electrification of uh, forklifts in warehousing, what you can see is there is a wide range of equipments that are coming into place, primarily uh, uh, based on the drive to reduce carbon emissions in warehouse. Now, when, we, when you look at warehouses, like I said, they are finding a place everywhere. Now, whether it is from whether it is for moving the material from the staging area to storage area or to bring it back to the steering area, you have a certain set of equipments being available which are primarily electric. Storage systems can be of low construction, they can be of a high bay nature. For low construction equipments, there are specific equipments. For high construction storage, there are specific equipments which are electrically driven that are, placed, that are in place. One might traditionally argue that warehouses handle lighter loads. So even for heavier loads, there are electrical equipments today uh, that can help you reduce emissions out of carbon, uh, or rather uh, diesel forklifts. Now for those uh, warehouses where a diesel forklift is a necess necessity, okay, fine, I'll come to that a little later. So uh, in terms of fuel cell innovations, uh, the batteries or uh, the lithium ion batteries are the way forward today, even though they are expensive at this particular point of time. No, uh, there are too many advantages and hence we believe lithium ion battery uh, technology is the future when you, when you have no choice but to uh, make use of diesel forklifts, today there are specific accessories like water mufflers, which reduce the amount of carbon emission into the environment. And all these equipments are now forced to follow uh, BS4 standards. And of course, there is a plethora of safety accessories. No, whether in terms of following the right people to operate the equipment, or when the equipment is on the equipment or to say which is the path of the equipment, there are accessories that are coming into play. There are camera systems to assist the operators in terms of correct put away, correct picking without disturbing the other material. There are load measurement indicators to ensure the correct amount of loads are being picked up without exceeding the prescribed limits for the forklifts. And also uh, no, into, in order to reach the right levels, no, assistance for reaching heights is also available as safety accessories. Operator training, skill development for operators has been an accepted practice today. Uh, when we talk about Godrej, Godrej has an exclusive training center in Vikroli uh, for this particular purpose. In fact, we have gone one step ahead uh, into even uh, making women uh, capable of handling forklifts. And there, of course, I mean, uh, besides the equipment suppliers having this as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a value proposition to the customers, there are exclusive institutes that are coming up uh, to, uh, to, uh, to make sure that enough Mr. number of Martin, forklift please. operators are available in the marketplace. Mr. Ashokma, two more minutes, please. So in conclusion, uh, what we can say is, sorry, yeah, in conclusion, what we can say is the warehousing technologies are in the journey of environment friendly raw materials, optimal use of precious resources, lower emissions, safety focus to minimize interruptions in operations, developing skills, and hence make the availability of people uh, for efficient operations and the life life period. Mr. Ashok Kumar, uh, your voice is breaking. We are not uh, able systems. to properly. Uh, so this is what is happening 
from a technology side at this point of time. And we Mr. believe Kumar, that uh, we are already moved in the direction of providing sustainable infrastructure to warehouse as a domain. Now, having said that, there are also other developers. Yes, sir? We are not able to hear you. Voice is breaking? Yeah, voice is breaking and uh, we are running short of time. Uh, I think yes, sir. we conclude. Hello, can you hear me? Are you able to hear me now, sir? Yeah, but uh, I think we are running short of time. So Just maybe... a second, sir. Am I audible now, sir? Yeah, yeah, you are audible, but uh, I think we are running short on time. So we, yeah, now it's uh, better. I think we, we are having some uh, issues of the connect issues with connections with Mr. Ashok Kumar. Uh, so I think we'll move forward in the thing. Uh, Mr. Ashok Kumar did touch on quite a lot of points on technology. And they did mention about uh, auditing and maintenance that has to be part of the thing. And uh, two points which, which I like is a design to optimize and for safety and sustainability and uh, co-create the solutions uh, along with the, with the customers or for the perfect adoption. So thanks to Mr. Ashok Kumar. Uh, sir, am I audible now, sir? Am I audible now? Yeah, uh, but I think uh, we will move now. Uh, I uh, summarize okay. your session. We'll share the slides. Sure. Uh, panelists and other. So thank you, Mr. Sure, Ashok Kumar, for uh, this session. Uh, going forward, uh, our last panelist, uh, uh, pocket full of money, uh, uh, Ankit, I would request uh, you to take over, uh, share your slides and share your views. Uh, Ankit, uh, over to you. Okay, hi. <clears throat> hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a it's a tough uh, suit to follow uh, after all the experts on the on the warehousing technology operations, but I'll I'll try and bring in uh, some perspective uh, from my real estate experience and how we think about uh, building this uh, essential infrastructure uh, called warehousing uh, for India in 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 the in the new economy. As uh, Jasmine touched upon earlier, this is a section of real estate which has sort of really come to the forefront post GST was implemented and, and has sort of really gotten accelerated uh, post the pandemic. Uh, we still believe that we are very, very early stages of, of the development of this particular asset class, uh, given the sort of long runway ahead in terms of the e-commerce growth, the manufacturing growth. There's a lot of uh, infrastructure, the warehousing infrastructure is yet to be built and uh, institutionalization of uh, this asset class has only started. So we believe that there is a massive opportunity uh, to sort of create this infrastructure for the new economy in a more sustainable manner, given that this whole sustainability has again come to the forefront recently, not, not just because of the pandemic, but the climate concerns have been around for a while. But I think it has also sort of been uh, now accepted that this is not just a climate concern, but it's, it's really is a good business practice uh, to sort of create infrastructure uh, which has sort of longer shelf life, which is sort of sustainable uh, to the environment, which is beneficial to the community. Uh, so, th so I think it's sort of really uh, upon all of us as the industry stakeholders to sort of really come together and define the roadmap for the warehouse warehousing industry, because it's going to play a very crucial role in the economy uh, to sort of how we create this infrastructure, which will benefit uh, the environment, benefit the community and benefit all the stakeholders involved. So I'm going to sort of touch upon a few aspects uh, that we at Logos are focusing on to sort of make sure that we are uh, sort of continue to be relevant and continue to sort of guide the path wherever possible. Uh, I think first and foremost uh, for us is uh, uh, we believe that what you uh, can't measure, you can't control. Uh, so we have we are uh, deploying a technology to sort of uh, track in real time basis the energy. Uh, consumption, waste and water management across our parks. Uh, so that sort of gives us uh, data points to be able to see how we are uh, measuring and making progress uh, on a day to day basis. And we are able to also work with our tenant partners to improve the efficiencies at the park level. So I think that's a that's a new technology that we are deploying. Uh, second is uh, uh, renewable energy, which uh, Gopala has also touched upon. It has sort of become important uh, to sort of incorporate solar, which again sort of leads to substantial savings uh, depending on the different regulatory regimes. 
but it has sort of become very, very competitive uh, to not ignore uh, in any parts of the operation. So just today, uh, we actually announced uh, the partnership with uh, NG, which is a global uh, leader in the corporate uh, uh, PPA space uh, for a regional partnership to deploy uh, renewable and on-site solar energy solutions across the logos parks uh, in, in all of Asia. So we are sort of working with our tenant partners to sort of make sure that we provide these solutions wherever feasible uh, so that their efficiencies increases. Third thing uh, is on the construction side where increasingly we are uh, using uh, our prefab construction methodology to sort of minimize the construction on site. This sort of helps in uh, minimizing waste, which also helps in our uh, health and safety initiatives to sort of make sure that we are able to sort of construct whatever uh, can be done off site and just sort of assemble it on site sort of really, really enhances the turnaround time uh, and, and sort of quality of the end product that we are able to deliver. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to touch upon was the whole electrification, uh, uh, which has sort of been going on in the sector. Uh, and we are also looking to provide EV charging infrastructure across our parks, uh, basis of our tenant needs. So I think these are some of the examples where we are really sort of investing uh, in, in, in the infrastructure today for the future. Uh, this is an investment that we are making for the long term and, and we believe uh, and we, we 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 think that the customers will see value. It was encouraging to hear uh, Mr. Rajiv talk about how uh, large customers like them are now looking at a long-term uh, view, which allows investors and players like us to sort of make those long-term bets and create the infrastructure for the future. Uh, Mr. Gopala also mentioned about uh, something which sort of really stayed with me, which is doing more with less. Uh, sort of drawing upon uh, my experience in commercial real estate where uh, I spent quite a bit of time in office real estate where uh, the, the, the usual metrics was the rental per square foot. Uh, over the years, it has sort of changed or it's sort of in the process of being changed to experience uh, per person or per square foot that you're able to deliver. And that was sort of brought on by a number of co-working and flexible space players who are able to provide there's some really vibrant uh, and, and, and highly productive workspace to, to office occupiers. So sort of, they really sort of changed the mindsets, both from an occupier perspective, as well as developers perspective, that they were not looking at the rental per square foot. And I think uh, this, uh, in the similar vein, what Mr. Rajiv said about the rental cost is not the only variable. I think there's an operational efficiency aspect of it, which, which we're able to bring uh, by creating this world-class infrastructure infrastructure with uh, sustainability solutions built into it, which helps our occupiers to sort of save costs in multiple different ways, not just sort of look at the rent per square foot that they are paying. And I'm glad that the tenants are responding to sort of look at the holistic, uh, holistic operational uh, parameters that they're able to derive uh, from such parks. So I think overall, I, I see uh, it's, it's, a, it's an exciting phase uh, to be in this, in this sector. Uh, there's a lot of new infrastructure to be built. And the good thing is the technology exists today. And, the, and a lot of this technology uh, is cost competitive for us to incorporate in our construction and operations to be able to deliver these uh, green warehouses uh, in an economically viable manner. Thank you. Okay, okay. thanks, Anke. I, I thought you'll be sharing the slides. I, I really like one slide which you have sustainability initiatives across logos in their portfolio. Uh, maybe if you allow, I'll, I'll try to share that uh, uh, for the benefit of audience. Mm -hmm. Can I summarize your thoughts? Oh. I've shared your uh, Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks, Nitin, for putting this up. Uh, yeah. Yeah, these are just uh, a uh, a few few various work streams that 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 we are uh, in the process of implementing. And again, uh, this is something which is a sort of a business imperative, uh, which makes good business sense for us to do it because we are able to sort of save cost and pass on those benefits to our customers. Uh, and, and increasingly, uh, more and more of our capital partners and customers are sort of committing to. Uh, being carbon neutral uh, by different time frame, which also sort of guides our business to be able to deliver uh, on those promises. So these are certain initiatives that we talked about. 
uh, sustainable procurement practices as part of our construction practice. What we also follow is something called the life cycle uh, analysis uh, for each and every component that we bring on to our site because it's also an embodied carbon that we need to factor in. Uh, we are sort of committing to deliver sort of net carbon zero buildings from year 2025 onwards. Uh, there's a massive sort of uh, effort uh, in sort of planning waste and water management at the park level uh, to ensure that we are able to uh, sort of recharge the aquifers uh, and able to utilize the rainwater in a most efficient manner in the park. Uh, all the roofs are sort of uh, uh, treated with uh, with a uh, uh, with a special film which reduces the the heating inside the park. And there are some of the small small things which we do, which sort of reduces the operating cost for our, our occupiers, which is not necessarily reflected in the rent per square foot when they compare to perhaps other spaces. Uh, and again, I think a few things that we have done at the park level, which is the renewable energies, uh, changing all the lights to LED lights providing electrical uh, charging infrastructures uh, that, that has sort of really helped uh, our own cost uh, parameters. Uh, hydro panels is an interesting technology which we are sort of uh, exploring uh, to, to address the water challenges uh, in, in, in many parts of the country uh, at our park level. And, and I think one, one aspect of ESG, which is sort of often uh, underemphasized, I think we, we, we talk a lot more about environment, less about social and governance aspect of it, both of which are equally critical. Uh, it is something that we are actively working on uh, addressing by providing uh, park level amenities, by engaging with the communities around our parks to make sure that we are able to bring a net positive change uh, in, the, in, the, in the micro market where we are operating. Uh, and, and also being good to the environment. I think there is one specific example that I want to highlight on the landscaping and plantation front is where we have implemented the Miyawaki uh, plantation scheme, which is a densest form of plantation uh, containing uh, uh, thousands of native uh, tree species, uh, which sort of provide homage to the local bird spe species, as well as the provide uh, fruit and vegetables uh, for the local population. So I think these are the kind of things as the sort of owner and operators of the large institutional uh, parks we can do to sort of bring about the change and provide a pathway to the industry. Great, great, uh, great thoughts. I think uh, you, you said the, the opening uh, remark, uh, warehousing for India. And I think that's very important. Uh, many times we, we try to uh, copy imitate from somewhere else. Uh, uh, in the world and uh, we don't think uh, of our challenges over here and then uh, we try to create Europe in India and which is not possible. So warehousing has to be uh, for India. And as you said, it's a early days, early stages and it's a long runway uh, going forward. Uh, and one very important part, it's, it's not about the climate issue but also is a good business practice. So one should follow this. Uh, Interesting thoughts. Uh, uh, one thing which you mentioned that measurement is the first step before you control. If you don't even know what you are spending, how can you control it? And I think I, I, I fully agree and endorse that uh, whenever uh, we have been trying to do, first step is to measure it and then you try to control. Uh, great. Uh, thanks uh, for all the um, uh, panel discussions. Uh, we'll take uh, now uh, for next five to seven minutes questions and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, I have some questions already. Uh, so the first question is from Mr. C.P. Joshi, Director, Softage ITL Limited. Uh, he says, warehousing can be an employer of very large size workforce in India. In the whole of technology advancement, how are we seeing it from employment generation point of view? And maybe I'll, I'll forward this question to Mr. Rajiv Mehta because uh, cement plants were one of the in, in the packing plant area and the logistics warehousing distribution you have one of the highest manpower how do we manage when we are talking about automation and new technology yeah thanks so you know mr joshi uh, even by improving efficiencies also we can generate employment so employment should not be generated at the cost of efficiency Today, we are not going for too many warehouses because of the cost. But by having more efficient and mechanized warehouses, if we can reduce cost, 
I think we will be able to go for more number of warehouses and generate more employment in the process at reduced cost as well. Absolutely, I think the volumes will go and the yeah. employment will not suffer, or maybe it won't suffer. It won't suffer, and then the automation comes. The skill level will increase, so you are helping the community to grow up also. Hundred percent. Uh, we have a next question from Mr. M. S. Vijayan, Strategy Officer, Cedar Retail. So, warehouse parks uh, park is an essential requirement since health and safety measures are taken into consideration. Road connectivity without disturbing the metros and cities, water and power and communication facility, which is imperative. Uh, views on and like to know the way forward. Uh, maybe this question I can forward to. Uh, Mr. Jasmine or Mr. Ankit, uh, this is more related to setting up a warehouse. So I, I think I think it's a million dollar question. We have to understand that most of the large warehousing clusters are outside the municipal limits. And when we say they are outside the municipal limits, the infrastructure support by the state is bare minimum. So everything that you see inside the warehouse or at least the approach up to the warehouse is done essentially by the private developers. So except for a road access, everything is something which is developed by the likes of the logos, the indoor spaces of the world. So Ankit is uh, tremendously responsible for creating a world plus infrastructure. As soon as you step inside the gate of that large in integrated industrial and logistics park, I think that the state can definitely support in terms of creating infrastructure to enhance the reach up to these clusters. Till now, I think we have, we have seen clusters mushrooming on their own because of a client demand going in a particular highway, a particular direction of a particular metro city. But I think, I think if the state, it's focused together, which is coming in now. So you have nodes around the various dedicated freight corridors where they are enticing investments to come in and set up manufacturing and industrial corridors. Now, these might be futuristic from a short-term perspective, but they will definitely see traction in the future. But in the short to medium term, I think we definitely need the support of the state, both in terms of power, as they say, Bijli Pani, sewage, all these basic infrastructures need to be there and continuous improvement and maintenance has to be there because the state cannot forget the fact that these are big revenue generators both from a taxation perspective, employment perspective, and consumption of utility perspectives. So much as we would want our warehouses to be green, we still consume a lot of utilities from the state grids in terms of power, water, whatever is available. So I think since we're generating revenue, since we're creating employment, I think the state has, has an equal amount of responsibility to promote infrastructure so that approach to these parks improves. Over to Ankit to add if I've missed out something. No, I, I completely uh, echo what uh, Jasmine said, and I think there's a lot of. Uh, uh, I think the uh, state uh, will play a huge role in in development of uh, various uh, logistics parks and and nodes. Uh, like I said, still very early days uh, in this industry. I think uh, there are many more uh, areas and parks need to be created, and where I think this infrastructure will will play a huge role for private operators and investors like us to sort of create. Uh, those parks uh, within our limits. I think next question I'll give it to you, Ankit. The question is from Mr. Pradeep Bari Galaxy Surfacans, and uh, maybe to uh, Mr. Devendra Rawat. Uh, uh, while searching for warehouses, what key parameters need to be checked? Uh, so, uh, Ankit or Mr. Devendra Rawat. Uh, well, I can take a go at it first. Uh, it's it's a bit generic because you obviously have to look at what is it that you are looking for. Uh, when what I was talking about more was that, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, things have really changed on what has been important for us. Uh, what are uh, other than other than the location uh, and, uh, you know, which will make sense from a, your network point of view, uh, from your logistics uh, point of view. Uh, the things that we are now looking at are uh, very different. We are we are really looking at uh, which, uh, warehouses which are constructed well, which are constructed in a sustainable manner, uh, which can help us in uh, you know uh, 
having a good workplace uh, which is uh, safe uh, hygienic uh, good for people so you know insulated roofs uh, to you know the kind of uh, facilities that the workers have and you know so all of that becomes a part of this uh, and uh, and that's really the change uh, which has happened uh, i think even 10 years back we were we used to probably look at the location and the logistics network etc uh, but the change which has happened in this this time period is really looking at the sustainable uh, elements of the warehouse and that's that's what has uh, uh, you know that is what has moved actually i would say in last uh, especially in last 10 years if i compare Can I add something here, Nathan? You are on mute, Nathan. Nathan, you are on mute. Sorry. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. So I, I think I think beyond what uh, uh, beyond the infrastructure of the warehouse or what goes on inside the warehouse, I think every client has to look at its own growth path. Gone are the days that you could move your warehouses every three years or four years. You should look at partnering with larger players with hundreds of acres of land so that your growth within a micro market is insured for the next three to five years, seven years, or maybe 10 years. I think a second issue that we have seen as a real estate service provider is that managing contracts is a big challenge. Making a logos or a, a Warburg or a Blackstone understand your contractual obligations is much easier than to make somebody like a Mr. Vyas or a Mr. Singh understand your contractual obligations your anti-corruption policies, so on and so forth, which are a standard part of your contractual obligations. The biggest benefit that you can draw by working with professional partners is not only ensuring scale expandability, but also replicating that contractual obligations from one micro market to another, because you are a national player. You would not just do warehousing in a single location and serve the whole country. You would need hubs and spokes across the entire geography of India. So I think scale and professional developers bring in that efficiency, bring in less headaches to your contractual obligations, bring in ease of operations. A second part that they bring as a professional developer is that you don't, you don't enjoy a building only for two to three years. A building has a sustainable lifespan of 15 to 20 years. Maintenance of those buildings and having a professional partner with escalation matrices who lives up to his commitment of the maintenance of the Park is very important. An individual HNI can shirk that responsibility and get you in a soup in three to five years' time because he would not want to reinvest and cut corners and shave off a part of his profit. But somebody like a Logos would definitely live up to their brand name because they do it for a living. They have a brand to protect. There is a certain escalation matrix beyond Ankit, his boss, and 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 right up to trend and then the investment community. So I think, I think those are the factors you should look at when you engage with a professional developer, except for what Devin said in terms of looking at hygiene, looking at whether the buildings are green, energy efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. That's all I want to say. I think we have quite some questions and uh, lack of time. So I'll skip a few of the questions. I'll go to one question, which is like, uh, and I'll put forward to uh, all the panelists. Uh, uh, the question is from Mr. Rohan Jagannath Shinde, Export Executive Galaxy. I said, which warehouse model most suitable in long run? Own, partially controlled by self, or wholly outsourced, including material handling equipment? <clears throat> so Mr. Rajiv Mehta, your quick take on it, Mr. Devendra Rawat, uh, Mr. Jasmine, Mr. Ankit, Mr. Ashok Kumar, Mr. Gopala, a quick one word on that. Only one word, wholly outsourced. <laughs> I'll add to that, I'll leave it to experts, is what I'll say. Yeah, Yeah, I, and, and I agree with uh, all, all of my co-panelists. Uh, that's what we do for a living, uh, to sort of uh, uh, maintain these premises over the long run. Uh, and, and provide the professional services and peaceful uh, possession to our uh, occupiers. See, I would only like to add that outsourcing has been the buzzword for the past decade or so, but I think it is becoming norm now. Word over the trend is sale and lease back. So even companies who had captive projects, whether they were manufacturing or warehousing, are today 
trying to basically become asset light by doing a sale and leaseback agreement with a professional partner. So I think I, I would go with the panelists and say outsource, outsource as much as possible. I think I think we'll we'll agree with you that outsource and agree to the experts and let the experts do the job. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv Mehta, Chief Logistics Officer, uh, Muja Cement, uh, for giving his views. Uh, really good points, cost versus value, and, uh, and and looking at long term, not not just the short term, and making it uh, as customized. Uh, Mr. Jasmine Singh, thank you very much for your views and uh, showing that if this is an industry to be in and this is growing industry and, and it will be sustained easily. It's, it's a growing and uh, consumption patterns are changing. Again, long-term view and fundings are available. That was a key point you said, as long as you're willing to do international things. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gopal Krishna, National Head, uh, Supply Chain, Big Basket. You said uh, more, uh, more with less, like we used to talk in uh, marketing, in uh, in branding. Less, uh, less is more. So uh, the more with less, I think that's that's the uh, that's the thing uh, one can do with standardization. Uh, thank you, Mr. Devendra Rawat, Director, Levi Stress Company. Uh, you took it to another level and uh, told us and uh, informed us rather that sustainability does not has to be just a part of the business, it has to be part of the life. Uh, you told about the key three pillars of sustainability. Thank you very much, Mr. Rava. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ashok Kumar, though we missed you somewhat in between, but uh, I think we got the gist of uh, your presentation uh, about the technology and you brought a good point of audit and also design to optimize and co-create the solutions uh, with the user for the better adoption. Thank you, Mr. Ashok Kumar. And last, uh, not but the least, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ankit Samadhya, Head of Asset Management Logos. Uh, and you said, warehousing for India, don't just bring anything, warehousing for India and in a sustainable manner. Uh, and your one single slide of uh, the initiative or the things what can do in sustainable manner in a warehouse, those are good. Uh, your point about uh, if you can't measure, you can't control, to start measuring before you start before you want to control. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you, audience. Thank you, all the esteemed panelists. Thank you so much for your uh, views and a nice panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Nathan. It's a lot, Nathan. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan.